Welcome to Mastara, and we who are about to game salute you. You gave the thumbs up this week to gladiators and monsters, and they ended in a dead tie. So I just picked the topic that was sitting on that list the longest. This week we're talking about the gladiators and Thyatis. This is a topic that was only touched on in the supplements, and so when I wrote the handbook I filled in all the details, and I'm quite proud of it. And not just because I'm paid to write about gladiators, or I raised a stink about the Houston Museum of Natural History putting on the flimsy ex excuse for a gladiator exhibit in history and having the gall for charging $30 a ticket and not representing the Republic era gladiators at all. But enough about buyer's remorse. I, Mr. Welch, and let's start stabbing each other. Since Thyatis is a mixture of Rome, Byzantium, and the Holy Roman Empire, the trick was to merge various gladiatorial styles together and update them for Mastara. Took as much as I could from historical examples when creating the gladiator schools I realized the book didn't need 50 pages of gladiators, so I cut it back down to eight. But first, let's talk about how gladiator contests get started. There's three types of people that fight in the arena that the organizers can use, each with different rules and the laws that determine their use. First up is the convicts, which are usually given impossible matches in the expectation of death. Anyone who is sentenced to death in Thyatis can be turned over to the arena as a convict, and you get put in the worst matches possible. You get to fight the monsters, or take part in large-scale bloodbaths that are battle recreations. Only on very rare occasions will a convict impress the emperor in a combat and earn a pardon. The problem is the odds of that happening are low, so when it does happen, the convict becomes a bit of a celebrity among gladiators. Plus, that also requires somebody to be in attendance that can actually pardon you like the emperor or a local governor, so don't count on it. Next up are the slaves that have volunteered for the arena. Thyatian law has a lot of restrictions on how slaves can be treated, and forbidding them from being sent to the arena without their consent is one of their biggest laws. It does seem like an oxymoron that a slave has to give consent before being turned into a gladiator, but the reason behind the law isn't altruistic. Gladiators have to be trained. Training is expensive. Slaves sent out without training die quickly, and quick deaths bore audiences. So unless the slave is willing to be trained and have a lot of gold spent on him, Thyatis doesn't want him fighting in the arena because that's bad for business. Now, why would a slave want to be a gladiator? Because it's a fast track to freedom. By Thyatian law, all coins thrown into the arena during a match are the property of the winner, and no one else can claim the money. Not the slave's owner, not the organizer of the match, not even the emperor. Since Thyatis allows all slaves to buy their freedom, a slave that fights well can earn quite a bit of coin, and that's if the slave doesn't impress a random noble that will buy the slave's freedom immediately. The last participant is the free citizen. The people that fight as a gladiator because it's their job. Many of the free citizen gladiators are actually former slaves that earned their freedom in the arenas and have decided that they're going to continue being gladiators because there is money to be made. Gladiators can make quite a bit of money fighting in the arena. Apart from the, the coins thrown to them in the match, gladiators can earn a portion of the gate. They can get appearance fees. They can even earn sponsorships from wealthy citizens. Free gladiators get to choose their matches. While this lets them turn down obvious suicidal matchups, if a gladiator turns down too many difficult matches, they are less likely to be hired in the future. The organizer of the match has quite a bit of paperwork to fill out when scheduling the event, as all events are heavily taxed. The organizer has to hire the stables that will provide the gladiators, plan each match, and schedule who's fighting who. Certain styles are only allowed to fight other certain styles. Men aren't allowed to face women. Different races can't fight each other. Every weapon has to be described, and so on. After the event has been scheduled, every participant is required to parade to the arena from a set staging area for a variety of reasons. First, it's so the crowd can see who's fighting and that raises interest for the event. The regulators in charge of supervising the events also want to see that every gladiator is healthy and ready to fight, and that every gladiator that is scheduled to fight is present, and that there are also no untaxed monsters or similar being used in the events. Gladiators unable to fight to the best of their ability make for bad matches. Bad matches make for unhappy audiences. Unhappy audiences make for violent riots, so all the gladiators have to be ready to fight. The organizer can arrange normally forbidden matches, like between non-traditional pairings of schools or mixing sexes or races and events. The organizer pays what they call as a fine, but it's in reality just another fee for the restrictions to be waived. The fees can be minor, like paying 25 gold pieces to allow a dwarf to fight an orc, all the way to tens of thousands of gold to have the gladiators fight a hydra. Organizers that don't pay their taxes, or stable managers that don't keep their gladiators healthy, or promoters that rig matches can face rather stiff penalties if caught. Emperor Thincall is a former gladiator. He takes a rather dim view on people mistreating his former profession. He has been known to sit in on trials of people violating the gladiatorial code, and even hands out sentences himself, which were always the person being sent to the games as a convict. There's a lot of gladiatorial styles used in Thyatis. All of them reflect on past glories and conquests. 
This allows former battles and victories to be easily recreated in the arena. The eight primary schools are Corvus, which represents the hinterlands, and they fight with a great club. The Flavis style is from Ochalia, and they have a Kusari, and they wear ring mail. Gimmon from the Pearl Islands are famous for the net and trident. Haranama of Yalarum use double scimitars. Iernus from the Isle of Dawn have twin hand axes. The Legio school represents the glory of Thyatis, fighting with a massive shield and longsword. The Maijo school is the newest of the gladiatorial schools, and it was partly inspired by Emperor Thencal himself. It reflects uh, the Alphatian wizards that were defeated after the Spike invasion, and they fight with dual clubs. The last school is the Millennix school. It fights with a spear and shield, and it is modeled after the Millennium Empire of old. All schools are armed the exact same way, and they all wear a similar helmet so the crowds know who is fighting in what style. Very few gladiators actually wear armor. Most schools don't allow anything heavier than leather if any armor is allowed at all. The crowds are there to see you bleed. Uh, hiding behind armor isn't going to help that. Only the Flavus school actually wears heavy metal armor in the form of a ring mail made out of coins. The armor provides minimal protection while stifling the movement of the gladiator. One of the emperors saw the unarmed Ochilian monks and thought it would be hilarious to put one in heavy armor and make them fight to the death. Some of the Thaitian emperors could be total dicks. You might be wondering why people would volunteer to be gladiators with such a huge chance of death every match. Well, the secret is, there's not. Gladiators are expensive investments for the stable managers and the organizers. They aren't there to kill each other, they're there to entertain the crowds. If they fight well, they're going to be given mercy. The only people who show cowardice, flail around and fight badly, or just fight dirty are going to get the thumbs down when they ask for mercy. Another reason why there's not a lot of death is it's expensive. Gladiators are valuable property and have next of kin, and if they die, then somebody's got to pay their owner or their family for the loss of income. Dying is what the convicts are there for. They sate the crowd's bloodlust, and the actual gladiators do the quality fighting for the crowd. Not saying death is impossible, but the powers that be do their best to keep the actual fighters alive. There's a few special type of gladiators that don't normally fight other gladiators. First and foremost, there's the Venators, the gladiators that fight beasts one-on-one. -on -one. They're typically armed differently for each creature, and they get paid handsomely for it. It takes a different kind of skill to fight an owl bear than it does to fight a berserker. Intelligent monsters don't fight Venators normally. They instead they fight against the regular gladiators, and of course that all requires a special permit with a special tax. The lesser gladiator to the Venator is the Bestiari. These gladiators fight against monsters or creatures in a group. These gladiators are actually trying to be Venators, but they're not good enough, or the crowds prefer mass battles, so that's why they have to fight in groups. They tend to fight uh, truly large creatures like elephants or dinosaurs or dragoons. They also have a higher fatality rate than other gladiators. Their skills aren't as honed as a Venator normally. And giant spiders don't really understand the concept of thumbs up. The last of the three quasi-gladiators, the Pagenearius, well that was the Latin term for them, these are the equivalent of circus clowns in the gladiatorial matches. They keep the crowds entertained between games, often fighting with comical weapons like pillows or feather dusters. They're awfully hen, much of the displeasure of the hen who hate being treated like children. They actually aren't in any danger. In fact, for some events, they're hired to fight the children of various nobles. They do make a good living, but they are gladiators the same way that stage fighters are actual warriors. Behind the scenes, gladiators find their lives be equal parts spartan and luxurious. They have to train. It's what they do when they're not fighting normally. But they're given the best medical care, and many stable managers make healthy donations to the various temples to provide healing for gladiators after the match. The Temple of Vanya is known to have its own stable of gladiators to further glorify the immortal. Gladiators eat well. Malnourished gladiators bring down the wrath of the emperor. They might live in gilded cages before being thrown into combat, but they do live well in those cages until it's time to fight. That draws this week's video to a glorious victory. There are a ton of adventures available for gladiators. Be it players that used to be gladiators that are now adventurers, players that are turned into gladiators against their will, or you can organize events to make money if you have a domain in Thyatis. The module Arena of Thyatis is built entirely around the concept of players being shanghaied into gladiatorial combat. Plus, find somebody who doesn't want to fight a vampire with just a net and a trident. So gladiators have been touched on their shoulder by the rudest of the internet. But unfortunately, the topic of Immortals Changing Alliances got your thumbs down. So we're going to add two new topics to the mix. Coming up is the military strengths of the known world and the Ethengar vs. Windar war that was speculated at in the 1005 timeline. Now, I did upgrade my computer to try to get better recordings, so let me know if you can tell if there's a difference. But until next week, remember, Pedersen non nonplus et ludus.
which I think is going on my family seal. Unfortunately, none of my family speak Latin, so that's a problem.